that you're doing now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, everyone who's here today, that we might share this word, God's word. Thank you for those who are tuning in and who will be watching this. May all of us receive this in a way that is pleasing to God. And Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord. Lord, we're all sinners. We don't deserve this blessing, Lord God, but you gave it to us through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, that we, we, we be redeemed and restored to the original intent that you had designed for us. I thank you, Lord, for the love. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, as a sinner, you did what your son did for us, Lord God, that we now can be reclaimed in your family. And I look forward, Lord, to seeing you face to face. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Today's message falls in line with what Robert was talking about. Okay? Like Pastor Tony said, when we're all functioning under the power of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, as believers, we will all be given the same message. God's plan and God's purpose will always come to fruition, no matter what level of faith that we have. If we carry a special anointing, His will will be done through us. We may delay the blessing. We may not have the fullness of the blessing, but His will will be done and He will use us in a way that is pleasing to Him, no matter what our perception is. Today's message is, it is finished. It is finished. What does that mean? There's nothing for us to do. It is done. It is finished. It's a very reassuring thought when you think about it. But what it means is, is that we oftentimes have to look into the future and understand what will happen. The prophecy, as we hear it, as we see it, reassures us that God's word is true. And even though the devil, the enemy, is trying to bring to not fruition of God's prophecy and to prove that he's a liar, that's how Satan it plans to defeat God, if he can destroy or not make come to fruition God's prophecy, then God is a liar, and Satan's victory will lie in that. So let us look at the prophecy in the Bible. Let us understand it. Let us read the signs and understand that God is in control, and his prophecy is the truth. And it will, it has, and it will always come to fruition. We'll start with Genesis 3. 15. It might be 313. That's probably a typo. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. At this point, God is speaking to Satan and explaining to him that he will put animosity between the woman and the devil. And between your seed, the woman's seed, that's all believers, and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God is speaking to Satan through the serpent, explaining why there's this animosity, enmity, between the followers of Satan, his seed, and Christ. And his followers, her seed. Jesus will defeat Satan, bruise his head, and Satan will cause Jesus much suffering for his work on the cross, bruise his heel. God has already prophesied that hatred between Satan and the followers of Satan, and we the believers, the children of God. He prophesied it then. And that's why things are the way they are. And I don't think Satan truly understood what this prophecy was. But he certainly understands now. For God had a plan to restore man. 
and the earth to its original intent. And once again, we're not sure Satan knew what that plan was then when he gave us this prophecy. But he certainly understands now, and so do we. Now we're going to go to John 19.20. And this speaks of Jesus and his last words on the cross. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Know that Jesus proclaimed he had finished the work that God had sent him to do. God's plan for the redemption of fallen man, the plan for the salvation of man, was now completed. All who believe in Christ and what he accomplished on the cross and his resurrection are no longer under the spiritual bondage of sin, but are now free and have liberty in Christ. For what the law of Moses could not do for man, Jesus did by being the perfect sin offering. He paid the debt, the ransom for all sin, and fulfilled all the requirements of the law of Moses. Ten Commandments. When God sees the believer, he sees Christ, holy and righteous. It is as if man's sin never existed, and the believer is judged and found not guilty. The believer is once again as if it was before the fall of man, part of the family of God, a son or daughter of God. The believer is born again, a new creation, no longer under the law of sin and death, but set free and under the law of life of the Spirit in Christ. And Jesus did not die of his wounds on the cross, but he freely gave up his life when the Holy Spirit led him to do so. Luke 23, 43, and Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. When he was on the cross and the thief was next to him, these were the words that he said to that, that sinner who accepted him as his Lord and Savior and knew he was the Christ. He said, I will see you in paradise. This statement from Jesus explains where the saints of the Old Testament and all believers would go after death, their spirit and soul, not their physical body, until Jesus finished the work on the cross and paid the sin debt in full. So they could now be received in heaven after that sin debt was paid in full. But before that was accomplished by what he did on the cross, they went to paradise. We learn of paradise in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, from the story of Jesus, told of the rich man and the beggar Lazarus. Paradise was next to hell, where the spirit and the souls of the dead would go. To one hell or the other heaven. Amen. Totally conscious of what transpires, either eternal torment in hell, in fire, and in the great heat, or eternal comfort and joy in paradise or heaven. Mm -hmm. Jesus spent only a short time in paradise and took all the believers' spirits and souls to heaven to be with him and God. All within three days after his death. Mm -hmm. So prior to what Jesus did on the cross, that great work, believers would go to paradise. But after he paid the debt, because he was the perfect sin offering, unlike the animals who had no blemish, but still had the sin nature about them, him being perfect and that he fulfilled all the requirements of the law, 
The sin debt was paid for. And now all believers go straight to heaven. Amen. Not their physical body, but their spirit and their soul. So we must understand, and this is what we were talking about earlier, these promises of what God has promised for us, we get a partial, we're only getting partial of it right now. We're not getting the completeness of the promise. That doesn't happen until the rapture. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible Amen. and shall be changed. This describes the first resurrection, what we call the rapture, where all believers whose spirits and souls are in heaven, or those alive who are on earth at the time of the rapture, will receive the glorified body that Christ promised to all of us. That's when we receive the fullness of his promise. The glorified body will not harbor the sin nature of man. And believers will be totally detached from all sin. Praise the, Lord. the believer at present, yes, is a new creation. And is separated from the sin nature. But it only goes to sleep. It sleep it lies dormant. It's turned off. But man can revive the sin nature by placing his faith in anything other than Jesus and him crucified. That is the order of God for this anointing and the power of the Spirit that we might live the victorious life. If we place it in our own works and our own abilities to please God, even though it may be something of goodness, helping people, praying, tithing, if it's not in God's order, he will not, cannot accept it. He will not rest from his works. Works. Well, let me go back. But man can revive the sin nature by placing his faith in anything other than Jesus and him crucified. It's the same thing we place our faith in for conversion. We have to do it every day of our lives. As Jesus said, if you want to come after me, Luke 9, 23, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. And that will allow you the full anointing of the Holy Spirit. And now through the power of the Spirit, which you can't do, we can't do, relying on our own works and our own flesh and blood. Now we can walk in obedience to God's word. The person who doesn't do that, he will not rest from his own works. He will operate under his own will. And in doing so, will fall back under the law of sin and death. He's committing, he's committing spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication, and is therefore lost back under the bondage to sin. This is the believer who can't stop sinning, who keeps doing the wrong thing over and over again, no matter how hard he tries, he can't stop doing it. It can be an addiction to smoking, it can be an addiction to drugs, it can be an addiction to sex, it can be gambling, it can be cursing, it can be being angry, Anything that is not of the word of God and the will of God, he will continue to do it because, as we all know, we are sinners, all of us. And if we don't accept that and know that the only way we can fix ourselves is not through some moral evolution. Amen. It's not through psychology. Psychology just takes the truths that are in the word and leaves God out of the equation and thinks that somehow we can take that and through our own effort, fix ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. Amen. We can't do it. 
Only the Holy Spirit can do it. Right. And it only happens when we surrender and give our will to God because we have faith in what Jesus did and only that and nothing else. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, Michael, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, raptured together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. This rapture will take place in the air, which is an actuality we learn from the Greek text, the lower atmosphere. It's about 6,000 feet above the earth. Clearly visible to all. And the vast multitudes of the states, think about it in this great occurrence. We have the saints coming down from heaven. We have the saints who are walking on earth, all meeting in the air with Christ. The cloud is the multitude, the vast number of the saints. When we die, our physical body comes from dust and will return to dust. That dust will rise and be transformed into the new glorified body. This is the future for all who believe and should comfort us all. But know also that the people who have died and gone to heaven, their dust will rise up first and they will get that glorified body first. And that all those who are alive on earth will come afterwards. The rapture that we're talking about marks the end of the church age. And the beginning of the great tribulation that will last seven years. In the beginning of this great tribulation, the Antichrist will emerge from the Middle East. And he will do what no leader has ever done before. He will bring peace to the Middle East between the Jews and the Muslims. He will somehow convince the Muslims to allow the Jews to rebuild the temple. And in a great act of sacrilege, the Jews will restore the animal sacrificial system. In total ignorance and denial of what Jesus accomplished, they will reinstitute that which has been done away with. Somehow, the Antichrist will convince the Muslims to allow the Jews to re rebuild this temple. Mm -hmm. And the Jews will declare the Antichrist as their Messiah. But the Antichrist is led by Satan. Mm -hmm. A fallen angel, the same fallen angel that led the Greeks, the great Greek Roman, Greek emperor. And the Antichrist, empowered by that fallen angel, and a confederation of ten nations made up of the territory of the old Roman Empire, talking about the beasts with the seven crowns. Yeah. All of the nations that conquered the Jews, starting with the Egyptians, and then the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the seventh unknown, the ten horns is the seventh. The ten nations of that old Roman territory. And after three and a half years, the Messiah will turn on the Jews during this great tribulation. And his intent is to exterminate them and yeah. destroy the prophecy of God. If he can kill all the Jews, the prophecy will not come true. That's written in Scripture. He'll take over the temple. He'll make it its headquarters and ultimately work to declare himself God. And he'll outlaw all other religions. The Muslims will be betrayed also. All religions will be outlawed. The Jews will have to flee to Petra. That's the deserted stone city in the city in Jordan, the country of Jordan. And the Antichrist, however, will be forced to leave Jerusalem in the middle of the Great Tribulation because of forces that are opposing him in the north, possibly Russia and China. And when he goes and he conquers those nations, he'll return to Jerusalem to fulfill it, to finish the calling of Satan, to kill every Jew alive, God's chosen people. 
and destroy the prophecy and the promises of God. If he can make God a liar, he will have defeated him and usurped his authority. And I didn't bring up this point here, but here we have it. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. The fact that during this rapture, those who have died first will rise up first with a glorified body, and those who are alive will be after them. Revelation 19.9 Then he said to me, Write! Amen. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The apostle John got this message. And this sort of shows us that all that follows was made possible by the work of Jesus and what he did on the cross. It just didn't help us for our salvation, but it made everything subsequent to that, the rapture, mm -hmm. the marriage supper of the Lamb, immediately before the second advent and the second coming of Christ. It's all connected to what Jesus did. Revelation 19, 11 and 14. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. This is Jesus coming back. And all the saints in their glorified bodies, in white linens and white horses, coming with Jesus, coming to defeat the second, excuse me, the Antichrist. This is what we call the second advent, the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is coming to save his chosen people with all the saints in heaven to defeat the Antichrist and usher in the kingdom age where he will reign on earth for a thousand years. <laughs> Revelation 19, 15 through 16. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, speaking of Jesus, that with it he shall strike the other nations. Jesus, make no doubt about it, is coming back as a warrior mm -hmm. to defeat the Antichrist and all the forces of power and wickedness. And he himself will rule for rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. And this is how you know it's Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. 21, 2, 3 goes on to say, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from out of heaven, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he shall dwell with them and shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he who said unto me, It is done, for I am the Alpha and the Omega, the bidding, the beginning, and the ending. It is done. When the Antichrist is defeated, Jesus will come down and reign on heaven for a thousand years. And the earth will be restored to its original intent. There won't be crime. There won't be dying. Animals won't be devouring other animals. The weather will straighten itself out. 
Not only the fall of man will be corrected, but the fall of nature, which accompanied the fall of man, will also be restored to its original intent. Jesus will reign on earth for a thousand years. The fallen earth and nature will be regenerated back to its original design before the fall of man and nature. Near the end of the kingdom age, Satan will be let loose again, having been sent to the bottomless pit with a big chain wrapped around him. <laughs> Defeated once again and cast into the light of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet already waiting there for him. Already waiting. As Sister Linda explained last week, we now have the second resurrection, the second death will take place. This will take place at the end of this millennial age, the kingdom age. The second death will take place. There will be two books at the time of judgment. With one being the book of life. And if one's name is not in that book, they will come to the great white throne. To give an accounting of all their sins. And will be found guilty and cast into the lake of fire and have an eternity of being in that lake of fire and brimstone with all the torment and suffering accompanied with that. Then will come the perfect age when God will have created a new heaven and a new earth and live on earth with his people. We must understand that all of this was made possible for us through what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. Jesus is the source through which we can now access God. But if our faith isn't in what he did, and we think we can do it some other kind of way, like Cain, what did Cain do for his sacrifice? He gave him the best of what he could produce. Mm -hmm. He was a farmer. He gave him the best of his fruit. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. But it's not within God's order. God would not accept it. He rejected his offering. It was of his works, his will, and not God's. And we have to be aware of that. So our faith has to be in Jesus. And only Jesus and what he did. And we have to allow Christ to become our Sabbath and rest from our work and our will, which gives the Holy Spirit the opportunity now to work through us. And it's the Holy Spirit that will heal us, that will change our heart. There's nothing we can do. But other than understand, our only currency is our faith. Mm. That's it. And the only means we have to access God is through what Jesus did. And the more faith we have in that and that alone, the more blessings we will have, the more we will change, and the more we will be truly transformed into the new creation. And we will be able to walk in the likeness of Christ. So when we speak of a faith of a mustard seed, it doesn't mean a little faith. It means the faith on one small thing and one small thing alone. And that's Jesus and Him crucified. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Amen.